Welcome back to the Innovation Engine Podcast. I'm your host, Steve Rowe, Three Pillars Healthcare Industry Lead. I am joined today by Andrew Sullivan. Andrew is an industry partner at Uncork, one of the world's leading codeless platforms for application building. Uncork is used by leaders in healthcare, financial services, insurance, government, and many other industries to revolutionize app development in the cloud and accelerate business agility. In the interest of full disclosure, Three Pillar is proud to be an official Uncork partner. The proud part, we don't need to disclose. That That's, everyone can know that. Uh, welcome, Andrew. Good to have you here. Thanks so much. Happy to be here. So let's kick things off with an intro to the world of codeless application development. Can you give our listeners some insight into what is the problem a platform like Uncork solves? How does it work? Why should a leader at a healthcare org want to listen to this podcast and be interested in this this technology? Yeah, it's a great question. So as you mentioned, we we work with a lot of heavily regulated industries, many of which have been around for quite some time, right? And what happens when you're uh, in the business of technology for a long time is you accumulate many times decades of technical debt. And so really our whole sort of concept and our founder, Gary, you know, was coming out of the, being the global CIO of MetLife, it started the business with the idea of, hey, wouldn't it be great if I didn't spend 80 plus percent of my multi-billion dollar budget keeping the lights on across all of my decades of technical debt, right? And, that, and that's not through anyone's fault. It's just how the industry has operated historically, right? You have COBOL and then you have Fortran and then you have Java, and .NET, and you know, even now onto low code, like different languages, different scripts, all of them, when they get built, they need to be maintained, right? And, and eventually that starts to choke the ability of the IT function to deliver business value and operate in an agile fashion. So Uncork is a platform that I'd say primarily we are in the technical debt elimination business. Hmm. As we build something on our platform, uh, there's no code to be maintained. There's only one code base for every customer, regardless of industry that Uncork maintains. So we let our customers get back into the business of building and collaborating on enterprise software. It's, it's always helpful to get a, a real world example um sure how companies are, are using um on could you could you few share a few examples of how some of your clients are, are using this kind of technology yeah absolutely um so we deliver a lot of customer facing experiences across the industries we serve right um and those kind of take i'd say largely two forms and right? we do a lot of um let's say smart digital intake and onboarding of customers for new applications for life insurance, for um, new customers in healthcare, for uh, institutions and financial services, right? A lot of these processes historically have been complicated, paper-based, uh, and sort of suffer from bad data or data incompleteness. So kind of think of it broadly as new customer journey management. Hmm. And then there's a, a second theme, which we're engaged a lot in, and particularly in healthcare, where um, I'll say this more of the uh, customer life cycle or kind of customer enforced management. So think about it as a presentation of information, customer portals, um, other sort of digital experiences, as well as the ability to transact with the customer in a purely digital fashion. So customer needs to make changes, they need to file a claim. Um, you know, we are taking that data from the point of the customer all the way through to typically whatever that customer or client's core system record is without any intervention uh, or further intervention from the IT team. What, what are the types of, uh, I guess, products or experiences where this is not the right technology? Yeah, f totally fair question. So I think Uncork is a platform We're typically supp supplying what I would call three key capabilities, user experience, that's a big one, whether it's customers, whether it's agents, whether it's internal operations, um, you know, very easy on our platform to configure a UI, style it, make it pixel perfect with branding, it's mobile responsive on the box. So, so we do a lot of interactions, but just as important from our perspective is our ability to integrate with other systems, whether those be modern or legacy based, right? So. And if you build an Uncore, it can be a REST API endpoint, connect very well to any other APIs. Uh, it's easy to manage those in the platform. 
Uh, but we also do, uh, you know, SOAP APIs, back processing, mainframe, database connection, a lot of those kind of uglier integrations, things that we focus on because it's a big pain point for a lot of customers who serve. And the last piece is around workflow, right? So a lot of business process with roles and logic, uh, being incorporated into the workflows on the platform, as well as data. Right? We, we, we don't have a, um, rich data model on our platform, so we can transform data uh, as it comes into the platform and as it goes out of the platform, so we can meet kind of that architecture where it is. So when you put all those together, what are we doing? We are we are kind of often becoming the glue that holds a lot of the disparate pieces of a customer's ecosystem together, right? You can connect to those systems. Uh, what we aren't typically doing is replacing some of those, particularly core systems of record, policy mm -hmm. admin, claims admin, um, you know, those are often vended products. Some of those are homegrown. Some of those are 40 years old, right? Uh, they're extremely difficult and expensive to replace. And, and really at the end of the day, what are they? They're, they're libraries of rules and calculations, um, that have been either purchased or maintained over time. We, you know, we like to think we can make those systems better. You could theoretically start from scratch and build all of those calculations in one but frankly, we don't really think that's a, Great use of time and rather enhance the value of what's already there and like focus on it as well. I was I was smiling. I, I didn't mention in the intro that Andrew is a U Chicago alumnus. So we know he's a smart guy and <laughs> used my question around what is Uncork not the best for to further tell us what, what it's great for. <laughs> Before you got to Well, you know, we all have a job to do, right? You know, one one of the things that I'm interested in when it comes to codeless application technology is uh, the the dynamic around build versus buy within a an incumbent legacy healthcare organization. So think about a health system, you know, a provider group, an insur a, a payer. Um, you have VPs who are extremely smart. They know what needs to be done. They want to iterate on that. Of course, all these organizations don't have the engineering capacity to be able to support those VPs to actually build that technology. Like, how, how do you, what are you seeing in healthcare in terms of organizations using a codeless application development platform like Uncork to build themselves versus going out and finding the, the solution that best approximates their vision? Yeah, yeah, uh, that's a great question. So. <laughs> Uncork is a toolkit, right? It's it's a different way to build software. And obviously, as I've said, there are some ways we think it is differentiated in the industry. And we can talk more about kind of how that fits into uh, no code versus low code versus full code. But Uncork is, it's a build motion, right? It is a custom software development capability, but it's a build fast motion and it's a build fast without maintenance motion. Right. So in a way, right, we, we are trying to enable these customers to solve problems more quickly and to do so in a way that doesn't tie up for the resources, keeping these apps alive. Right. Um, and so we often are in a position for a particular use case, uh, where there may be a competing solution an off the shelf product. Right. And, you know, where we find our platform use versus a product is how appropriate is that product for the architecture, right? And if that product is, hey, it's got everything we need and we can turn it on tomorrow and pay a SaaS license, implementation is next to nothing, okay, like that, that's a product choice and there are plenty of fits for plenty of products out there. Um, but when you get into the business of customization and where we find is even a lot of off the shelf products or use case still need to be heavily adapted for a customer's specific ecosystem, either in terms of its features itself or in terms of what that customer needs to do to get to the product, right? Integrations, adapting middleware to, in, to communicate with that product. That's the stuff that we do really well. And, and so, you know, in our view, um, you know, that's the fundamental trade-off and, and where, you know, we, we tend to stand out is, you know, if that product needs to be adapted or even worse that those adaptations need to be maintained. Um, yeah, you're not in the customer, custom software development business, and you're not getting the value out of the turnkey product. Um, 
how let, let's let's get some more examples of of how this is being brought to life um, in healthcare specifically. Uh, can you can you share some use cases where, uh, you know, obviously there's digital health companies. I presume they're probably not using Encore because they have their full teams of engineers and designers and, but you know, I imagine especially the kind of the legacy health systems provider groups you know, med device, pharma, payers, um, g give us a flavor of how, like what they're building, um, with this. Yeah, no, uh, you're absolutely right that primarily our audience is people with legacy. However, in multiple verticals, healthcare included, we have been the platform of choice to stand up a digital health company rapidly, right? Because a lot of the things those companies need to do you could pay full stack engineers to do, or you could use a platform like ours to do it. Yeah, faster and yeah, you know, with the accent light is not the word, but a, a lighter um, sort of commitment of resources than you know, otherwise. You know, you're kind of tooling your product from first principles. So it, it is done, and can yeah, you know, we've got some examples in healthcare where that's been done. But for the legacy healthcare set, which is 99.99 percent of the healthcare industry. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a few different key themes. I would say in the um, sort of clinical space, prior authorization is a big one uh, for us, right? A lot of these, um, particularly payers, have a bunch of rules living in languages as old as COBOL that um, they're very difficult to adjudicate, right? Or they need to be, you know, someone sitting, a poor nurse is sitting in front of a green screen manually working through the decisioning engine, right? A lot of what we do there is actually be the kind of front end for that uh, legacy decision engine where you present a modern sort of user-friendly guided experience to interact with those, you know, decades old rules in a way that feels modern and it uh, lends itself to a lot less operational expense to, to process, let's say, prior office. Case management or decision management, care management, it's another kind of flavor of that where you know, our customers are looking for symptom diagnosis uh, sort of guidance or um, clinical recommendations. And, and they, they have all of the intelligence already. We're just helping them get that to the front door. Right? Hmm. And that, that's kind of our, our, the role we play in the, in the clinical space, I'd say, primarily. Um, beyond that, in healthcare, there's probably another other few areas, right? The, as I, you mentioned before, our first and still largest business is insurance. So a lot of the payers have also extremely large insurance businesses uh, around them. So both the, you know, the payment of care as well, the provision of care. And on that insurance side, you know, a lot of our core insurance use cases are applicable. How do you get new customers onboarded efficiently into a system of record? How do you get them to buy insurance in a way that's quick or for group cases, underwrite them in a way that's efficient? Um, how do you help present their bills, their claims, uh, those customer interactions in a um, you know, modality that is modern and sort of two current expectations in the year 2024, where in some cases, you know, these portals can be you know, fairly ancient. Um, but I would say that's, that's probably the, the portal side is a little more indexed on the core payer insurance operations. On the clinical operations side, you know, we probably do a little less of the portal stuff. We do have some implementations of patient portals for healthcare systems, uh, where customers are scheduling appointments, learning about procedures, learning about um, sort of uh, disease categories. Um, but less so in healthcare, are we doing claims processing just because one, those systems are high frequency, they already exist. Um, and so we might be integrating to them rather than kind of supplying the direct capability. Can you elaborate on what you did for Mamaides? Yeah, yeah, we're we're essentially their digital front door, um, and yeah, you know, it's a public facing application. Uh, users can go in, they can find providers, uh, learn about um, you know care and procedures. The provider finder is uh, guided by condition type, and specialty, and availability. They can schedule the appointments directly. Um, so basically, everything up to I would call it the point of care provision is kind of the role we play there. One 
you know, what, one of the tough decisions at any incumbent healthcare organization, certainly I've seen this across health systems and payers. So you have, you have multiple data sources that aren't necessarily connected. You have multiple internal operating systems. So the pop health team is using one system. The, the customer service team is using another system is, is what I'm hearing, uh, you, you know, what, one of what we try to do at three pillars, speed the value. Like how can we get you something that's valuable quick? It is what I'm hearing that one of the, I guess, cool possibilities that this tech uh, codeless application development platforms allow is t like, Hey, you don't have to completely rebuild those internal operating systems or data sets. What you're doing is layering on something above that so that, you know, the customer service rep has act, ha has, instead of going into the pop health tool, yeah. And toggling between that and the, you know, we're just building a new application. It's like, hey, we connected this to all the systems. Here's your view into all those different systems. Is that is that accurate? That's exactly the way um, we think about it. And generally, the view is, hey, if you have components in your ecosystem architecture that are fit for purpose, we don't need to rebuild this. We can shape what we do based on what's there, because particularly on the data side. As I mentioned before, we have a fluid data model. This orchestration activity is a very common one for us, right? So we have examples of this where we've done as many as 26 different core system integrations, all with one unification layer, one front end. So, you know, A, someone can have all that information at their fingertips based on, you know, whatever data elements can be provided in the front end to unify the data, right? Customer ID or um, you know, policy number, things like that. Those allow uh, essentially that kind of single pane of glass to to be that home base for, let's say, a CSR or case manager. Um, where you know, again, there there are technical uh, considerations here in terms of what's available and what can be queried real time versus what has to be batched overnight. You know, just depending on you know, what the mainframe can support in some cases. But um, yeah, that, that general theme is, is one where we like to spend a lot of time. So I want, I, I want to understand a little bit more what it looks like to actually use a platform like this within a healthcare org. Um, and I think any CTO or CIO is tracking this perfectly. I, I think if you're a clinical leader or a pharmacy leader, Customer service leader, a for, I say this as a former chief strategy officer. I, you know, it's. Let me try to summarize or give an analogy, and then you tell me if this is fair. I'm okay. thinking about you know building a personal website. You go back, fifteen years, ten years. You know, you need a front end designer. You need a back end design. Uh, excuse me, a front end engineer, a back end engineer. If you want to take payment, you have to build all that code, essentially custom code development. Um, now I can go on to Squarespace, for example, and it's template, you know, it's templated. I can drag and drop the payment integration. I can, uh, you know, there's, there's a design template that I can, I can choose from different design templates to have something that looks good. And I'm kind of moving things around and then boom, the software is all taken care of on the back end. Is that, is that a fair analogy? To, to what you're doing, not building personal websites, but building you know, <laughs> healthcare applications. Yeah, it's just slightly more complicated than Squarespace, but I, I think you're, the analogy is directionally correct, which is, look, we present a visual canvas to develop software. And you know, it's probably slightly more atomic than Squarespace because every customer has got specific needs, but we have a library of components. Those components are available for everyone and the other common things like you would expect uh, you know, uh, input fields, processing fields, integration components, um, all of which can be stitched together to build an application. Or as importantly, components or macro components of an application, right? Because reusability is a big principle for us. So uh, in some cases, we ourselves on Quark develop accelerators, which are ultimately these are just blocks of components um, that we can deploy to customers' environments as, you know, useful ways for them to accelerate their own builds. Our customers can also build and maintain their own kind of enterprise widgets or components and reuse them across their state for Encore. This is really easy for us to do because 
everything you build from an application definition in our designer is saved instantaneously as data, as JSON, right? There's no, there's no custom language, right? Uh, and it's compiled essentially immediately, always when you hit save, which means you have a demo available of anything you built the second you hit save and hit preview and you run it through our renderer. So I, I think, um, yeah, it allows for that kind of one purely visual design where a business person can, yeah, they're probably not building the enterprise integration components of an app, but they can see what's being built. They can react to it. They can collaborate very closely with, an, you know, the IT team that's likely leading the build. And I do say this is an IT led platform because we are, we're doing hard stuff here, right? It's, it's enterprise software. It's connecting to multiple systems. Yeah. You, know, you need just because it's visual in nature. It doesn't substitute for good software design principles, right? How you design a query is going to affect the performance of your API, which is likely not what, uh, you know, clinical operations person is thinking about. That's fine, but they can sit together and they can look at the app. And, you know, our sprints are typically two weeks long and every sprint has a demo because that's the nature of the platform. Great. So, so that's exactly where I want to go, which is, you know, whether you're talking about the prior auth use case or building a new, uh, you know, system that's going to directly face members or patients so they can schedule their appointment, whatever it is. Um, to your point, the, the VP at that org, she or he knows exactly what they want from a business outcome. You know, I need something that makes it easy for, but you know, you, you good, to, good products are not just, here's a team of engineers. There's design sure. components. You have to think through the architecture, there's iterating, there's, a B testing, you need a product manager. So yeah, may, maybe give us a little bit more. You started hitting this at the end, how you go in and work with an org, particularly an, an org that, you know, is, is kind of strained for those resources. Like, yeah, they have designers, they have product managers, but there's a big backlog of requests. And, you know, I'm a VP of Pop Health. Hey, I want to, I want to build this new application. I heard this podcast with Andrew. And it's like, we'll get in the back of the line. Uh, you know, the, the IQ, the ITQ is, is a year, year long. So, 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 so tell me a little bit more about how you, how, how you help, uh, how you work with orgs, uh, given those obstacles. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, I, I didn't say this earlier, but you know, we think of the platform as a efficient way to turn good ideas into something. Right? Those ideas are often coming from the business. I want to solve this problem. I want to implement this solution. Um, you know, the important part of that that you have to get right, you have to focus on is discovery, right? And I say discovery both in terms of us understanding what, you know, this is my job a lot of times is to understand what the client wants to do, potential client, and making sure that sort of comports with what the software is good at doing, right? So if they say, hey, I want a new claims management system, I'd say, yeah, I don't know if I want to have that conversation, but uh, if it's, I need to help onboard patients or providers or, you know, provider portal, like, great. So we go through that conversation and typically our, our customers you know, work with, particularly on their first use case, a partner like 3Pillar, for example, that's going to sit with them and really hammer out like the, the requirements, right? And so this is where you know, we like to say our delivery is agile, but our discovery is waterfall, right? We want to know what they want to build. What they want it, what they want it to look like. Um, you know, what are the key integrations or components of that to the rest of their estate? Which you know, again, very few of our apps live in a vacuum. They're typically like a critical component connected to the rest of the ecosystem. And once we have those things, you know, a we've got um, we probably have going in a pretty good idea of yeah time and materials to build it, um, and what we can leverage from our library of accelerators to make it even faster and cheaper for them to do. Um, but once everyone says, you know, this is what we want to build, yes. You know, then we really get into the process of um, kind of, you know, delivering in that agile fashion. Uh, but you know, that is that is the most important phase, frankly, of, every pro of any project. And so I think the from our perspective, the burden of delivery is can be pretty light on let's say IT and product owners, um, I'd say largely, you know, we need them outside of discovery for guidance and testing, particularly you know, we're calling services in their environments 
they need to tell us that they're working with a certain process. We do, what we don't need to do is consume a bunch of their dev resources, right? So, you know, from our perspective, you know, and, and they can shift that over time. Like we have, we have some customers that are fully self-building on the platform. Uh, they only call us when they need help. Uh, and, you know, that's a, that's a journey that some clients undertake. Some of them always wanted to be outsourced. I would say the thing that catches most clients by surprise is running out of backlog. And um, <laughs> it's not a historical phenomenon they're used to. Um, and so that's what we're very diligent about um, getting those requirements defined, getting enough work for the team because we can deliver on it. The platform delivers on it very quickly. Um, and so we need to make sure everyone's kind of on board with you know, what they're committed to bringing on the timeline they're doing so because we're going to move fast. It's incumbent on me at this point to shamelessly plug that three pillar also helps with this kind of wrap around, hey, you want to build something, maybe you don't have the IT, you know, product design, architecture resources, uh, that, that's where we partner with Encore to bring that to a healthcare org to, to put something like this in motion. Um, all right, I want to ask three kind of we'll tr uh, more technical questions, um, kind of make these quick hit. First question, uh, you've been describing Encore as a codeless application development platform. The term that gets thrown around is low code, no code, low code, no code. So, so what is, this is not low code, what is low code versus no code? Can you just quickly define that for us? Yeah, so the simplest way to think about it is many companies in the category of low code, no code have some sort of proprietary scripting language or process. All you've done in that case is create a different kind of technical debt that needs to be maintained that's gonna get on the compliance platform upgrades. And when we say no code, it is truly no code, no scripting permitted in the platform. That is the value proposition to our client. So you know, as part of our license, every client is always kept in the latest version of our software. That's only possible because there is no custom scripted objects. So for us, that is low code, or I'm sorry, that is no code. What is the distinction between no code and RPA? Robotic process automation, you know, as 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 we we do a lot of work in kind of RCM and claims management. How do we automate manual tasks? You know, using RPA is is helpful. <laughs> sure. What de define for us RPA versus low code? Oh, uh, sorry, no code. <laughs> Good. That's like we're making progress. Um, so, like, our, our, I, RPA is. Uh, a useful tool and we integrate to a lot of RPA uh, partners, right? Uh, the difference in my mind is a no-code application development process is you are defining a specific and exact solution to a problem. And usually that problem is data fidelity or variability, right? So like a, a huge body of our work is designed to eliminate not in good order, submissions, applications, data, all of it on the front end, right? And so when you have clean data and the structure you understand, you can get that exactly to where it needs to go without any further intervention, right? Uh, and, and so, you know, we think of ourselves as an excellent structured data processor. RPA, to me, is how do you handle the other steps, right? That is, uh, you know, Unstructured, unpredictable, um, you know, you, you kind of brute force computing and interpretive power to get to that data structure, right? And that's where, you know, particularly as an intake vector, for example, let's say we're sitting behind an RPA tool that is, you know, taking claims intake and, you know, that's what they're good at. And we may be the orchestration level to get the structured inputs post validation down into that system. It's also where we're seeing more you know, AI-based document processing, data processing tools as an integration point for Uncork as well. And I just want to point out, we are well into the interview, and it's the first time I mentioned AI, and I'm proud of that. Um, but yeah, that, that's to me the difference. Is like we we are a specific structured data processor versus uh, solving for like a unspecific or unpredictable data problem that RPA is typically tasked against. If you weren't going to mention AI, I was because it's 2024 and we can't. We, we well, can't. it's 2023. We would have had to do it 
at the beginning, like it would have been the first five minutes. So, yeah, that's right. Yeah, this right. is the difference of a year. Yes, that, that's exactly right. The, the rule that you must discuss, how is AI impacting this, still holds for good reason, but it it's, it's, uh, doesn't have to be everything. So, so on that note, tell me about how, how is AI and all these breakthrough technologies impacting how you think about what a codeless application platform can, can be? Yeah, yeah, that, it's a fair question. Um, I would say there's, there's three kind of themes that we see in you know, the intersection of AI and Quark. The first is you know, we are an open architecture software development platform. So we make it very easy to incorporate, to test, to experiment with AI-based use cases in the context of a larger enterprise software deployment. So as I mentioned, let's say we have a client that's getting a lot of paper because they still have to accept paper. We may have a digital front door as an alternative, but paper exists. You know, AI-powered document processing engines extract, structure, validate, send data on Quark. We do all of the things that we do really well with that structured data. We're consistently getting tasks with the um, and you know services, prompt engineering, chatbots in the context of our customer-facing applications. So it's very easy to plug those in. We're very good at feeding them the data they need, um, and, and so you know it's an extension of a lot of the applications that we're already providing. And our customers can choose their own providers to, to experiment with. Like we are not wed to a solution in that regard. Mm -hmm. So that kind of AI. Factory AI Studio is something that we can support using our platform tooling. So the second theme is really around um, migration of legacy applications to IT. And this is where we get more into kind of the the gut, the balance of the IT operation, which is, hey, I'm a healthcare provider, insurer, whoever. I've got four years of technical debt. Um, you know, my Java web series on the server is going to be expensive to you know, upgrade. Code is a language, right? And there's lots of different ones. Uncork application JSON is also a language, right? I mean, we, uh, and you can train an LLM to do that, right? And so we're increasingly working with a lot of, uh, you know, AI firms to say, hey, we'll train, you train your model on one side of these legacy application definitions. You train it on Uncork JSON on the other side. And that will get us not 100% less of a please upgrade into a no code from a heavy old code, but 60, 70, 75 percent, right? It's a it's a big lift for uh, an IT project that otherwise probably is just not going to get done. And we and we think we're frankly just starting to scratch the surface and addressable applications in that uh, domain as the models are getting better, right? And it's like COBOL is hard. Like it's it's difficult even for an AI to interpret. We are seeing a lot of um, progress there, and we've done a lot of proofs of concept clients in the space recently. Hmm. And then the the third one is so we've got AI attached to Uncork, AI feeding Uncork applications, and the third one is AI within Uncork design itself. And this is you know kind of like the AI assisted uh, within our ID. So you're building software visually. You've done embedded AI tool that's going to help you troubleshoot your application, make recommendations on what to build, um, you know, very similar to sort of the kind of capabilities you're seeing in original software development, you know, no code. Great. Well, thanks for joining today, Andrew. If people want to find out more about Uncork, where can they, where can they get in touch with you? Well, uh, always, uh, feel free to reach out to me directly, particularly anything related to insurance or healthcare. Welcome to check us out on our website, uncork.com. You can get in touch with us there as well. And um, yeah, appreciate the time, Steve, and look forward to connecting with uh, you and all of your uh, all of your listeners. Right on. And don't hesitate to reach out to me if, if you are at a healthcare organization considering using a platform like Uncork. We are partners with them. We help organizations think about their technology strategy and bring new digital products to life, leveraging tools like, like Andrew's discussed today, these codeless application platforms like Uncore. Andrew, thanks again, man. Thanks, Steve. Really appreciate it.